Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We are the Cincinnati Recorder Consorts, and we are amateur musicians brought together by the love of early music, mainly from the 15, 16, and 1700s. Our membership comes from a variety of backgrounds. We have engineering, computer science, education, library science, medical, and insurance. This evening, we dedicate this performance to our friend and longtime member, Cynthia Wilson, without whose enthusiasm this group would not be possible. Our first piece was by Italian composer Giovanni Gabrielli, who was born in Venice and studied music there with his uncle Andrea, who at the time was the principal organist at the Basilica of San Marco. In 1585, Giovanni would take up this same position due to the architecture of the Basilica the Gabriellis cultivated the polychoral Venetian style where small groups of musicians were placed spatially in uh, separated lofts and galleries to produce striking antiphonal or back and forth effects. During Gabriellis' career, music in Europe was moving from the Renaissance polyphonic style uh, where each voice in the composition had its own independent line to the Baroque style where polyphony was used but was pulled together with the use of the continuo as we will hear in the Bach, Buxtehudi and reach your pieces later in the program. Just a quick word about our instruments. Most of our instruments are recorders, and you probably remember them from elementary school. You may have played one like this years ago. Anyhow, uh, while what we're playing are essentially the same, we have different sizes and hopefully better quality than 
than what you'd be playing in elementary school. So we do have some soprano recorders. So Maria here is actually playing a Renaissance soprano. And we have the alto. Who's got an alto? Yes, Anne, which was very popular in the Baroque era. And the tenor. And the bass, which John has over here. And a great bass, which Jim has. And one of our members who's not playing tonight also owns the contrabass, which is even larger than this one. In addition, we have two special instruments. We have the viola de gamba, which is, a, which is a cousin of the cello, but the viol family of instruments develops somewhat separately from the violin family, which the cello is in. And we also have the harpsichord, which was the uh, most popular keyboard instrument in the Renaissance and Baroque eras. Um, but in it, it the, the strings are plucked instead of struck, as it would be in the piano. Um, our next piece is by English composer William Brady. Or William Burr, thank you. <laughs> playing a couple of Renaissance pieces on the harp and uh, the uh, in this uh, collection I'm playing from there are a lot of dances and airs uh, from the 1500s originally intended for instruments like keyboard lute or voice
The next pieces are by composer William Brady, who was born in England in about 1560 and died in 1630. However, he spent his entire working life abroad. He found work in many courts in the north of Germany and Denmark, most notably in Brandenburg, Copenhagen, Bukeberg, and Hamburg. All of his surviving works are for stringed instruments and most of her dancing. The next two pieces are taken from a set of Brady dances published in 1609 and form a paired set. The first is a pavan or a padawana, and it is a stately dance in four beats to the major. The second piece, a galliard, is a lively dance characterized by leaps, jumps, hops, and similar figures. This particular galliard can't make up its mind whether it is to be in a double three or a triple two, a technique known as hemiola. Galliards were a favorite dance of Queen Elizabeth I, but I'll caution you, it is not one to be improvised lest you feel like putting on your dancing shoes.
The composer of our next piece, Claude Lejeune, was one of the leading French composers of his day. He was a prominent member of the Academy of Anton de Baif, whose mission was to recover the effects of ancient music and compose all their songs on the models of the fixed rules of the Greeks. In spite of the fact that not one note of actual ancient Greek music was known to 16th century, mu uh, 16th century Europe, this rather mechanical approach to composition would likely have died an even quicker death had it not been for Lejeune's talents. Somehow, Lejeune managed to synthesize this approach with other popular contemporary resources into a style of great depth and subtlety. This piece we'll play for you now, May Fait Les Bois, or May Makes the Woods, was published in 1612. Lejeune uses two choirs to contrast the month of May with all its light and joy, played by Choir One over here, against a miserable poet, played by Choir Two behind me, who feels his own troubles are only heightened by the arrival of spring. Not surprisingly, the two choirs each have their own music with very little overlap. Only towards the end do the two choirs begin to share musical material. Johann Sebastian Bach. Just the name evokes the highest standard of Baroque era music. Yet after his death in 1750, his reputation as a composer declined, regarded as old fashioned as the classical era was being ushered in. However, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, a few prominent composers such as Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Mendelssohn, recognized Bach for his keyboard works and were influenced by his style. Fast forward to the 20th century, the Peary Performance Movement recognized the musical and instructional value of Bach's work. Bach's music is even featured three times, more than any other composer on the golden record sent deep into space with the Voyager probes. Clearly, Bach's reputation has recovered and grown over time. As a music director of the Boys Choir in Leipzig, Bach's duties included composing and performing cantata each Sunday and feast day, corresponding to the lectionary readings on that day. In total, he wrote more than 300 sacred cantatas. Our next piece, Volmir, or What Bliss, 
is the seventh of eight movements in a cantata written for the first Sunday after Epiphany in 1724. The gospel reading for that day was from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, which records Mary and Joseph finding the boy Jesus in the temple. Volmir, which is an aria for alto and tenor voices and oboe de mor and string, states, What bliss I have now found Jesus, now am I no more distressed. He whom this my soul doth love comes to me for joyous hours. I will, O my Jesus, now never more leave thee. I will now, in faith, ever steadfast, embrace thee.
like to talk a little bit about my favorite subject in Renaissance music, and that's ornamentation. Um, musicians in the Renaissance period, as well as the Baroque period, were expected to play many more notes than what was on the page. In fact, in the Renaissance period, what was on the page was kind of like a skeleton. And then um, performers were expected to use that as a basis for making what's called ornaments or doing divisions, as they called them in England. Um, it's kind of ornamentation in the Renaissance is a little bit um, like the way jazz musicians take a tune and then they improvise on it um, and come up with things. Mozart's variations on Twinkle Twinkle Little Star um, are an example of this as well. So I'm going to just play a little bit and kind of make up some um, ornaments as I go along. I'll play first time straight and then the second time I'll try and embellish it. <laughs> There are no recordings from the Renaissance period. We're fortunate that there are a couple treatises, actually there are several treatises that um, tell you how to do the ornaments, how to play the recorder, how to play the viol, that we can get our information from. Um, one of these, one of the um, composers who wrote a treatise was Silvestro Ganassi. Um, he's from Venice, and this was, he wrote this in about 1535 and it was called Opera Intitulata Fontagera. Um, and he um, provides instructions for fingerings, ways to tongue the recorder, whether it's single tongue or double tongued. Um, and he had a comprehensive fingering chart too, on all sorts of um, alternate fingerings and all the way up through notes that aren't commonly used um, by people who play the recorder. As well as that, he listed over 3,700 examples of ornamentation on a single interval, um, from the most basic to the highest complex complexity. Um, I'm going to play, play through a couple examples. There's actually one, two, three, there's a bunch of them. They're all based on this interval. Um, and he just lists a whole bunch of examples of what to do. Here's the first one. Oh, I should mention too that one of the rules is you start on the first note and it almost kind of doesn't matter what you do as long as you end up on that second note. <laughs> Here's one that works kind of with um, changes in rhythm. to do is measure is to memorize every all of the 3700 examples here it's more like uh, you play through them and kind of get the feel for them and then you can make up your own okay 
The other enlightening example that I'm going to talk about um, is a three-volume set called Der Fluten Lustaf, and it translates to Flute's Garden of Delight. Um, first appeared in 1644 by a composer named Jacob van Eyck. Now, van Eyck was born to a noble family, but he was born blind. Um, and as um, he reached adulthood, he worked as a carillonor, an organist, organist, a recorderist, and a composer. Um, obviously, he didn't write down these embellishments, but someone spent an awful lot of time listening to him and transcribing it as they went along. So I'm going to play um, a piece called Engels Nacht. I can't even pronounce it. It's Dutch. Anyway, it translates to English Nightingale. And it's another one of those things where it starts out with the, probably a simple folk melody, and then there's divisions on that.
piece we just played was composed by Dietrich Buxtehude, the great composer of the Baroque era. He was born in 1637 in Denmark, and then he lived most of his life in Germany, where he worked as a church organist. And he's best known for his organ works and his choral music. This piece that we played is called Cantate Domino. He wrote a number of these songs, these religious songs. It was originally a choral piece, a song of praise to the Lord. Uh, Buxtehude, just for a little interest here, he was admired by the great Baroque composers and inspired them. Uh, these folks including J.S. Bach, George Frederick Handel, Telemann, and Johann Matheson. Um, there's a famous story about how the young Bach walked 250 miles to meet and learn from the great Buxtehude. And two years earlier, both Handel and Matheson separately traveled to see this elderly composer and musician who, because he was ready to retire, offered them each his post, but with the stipulation that they marry his eldest daughter. <laughs> Neither accepted the offer. <laughs> uh, the next piece we're going to play is by a Venetian Baroque composer named Giovanni Battista Riccio. And there's very little known about him, other than that he lived in the early 1600s, was probably a violinist and organist, and he's known to have published three books of music, both sacred and secular. And we'll be playing one of his secular songs called La Zanetta, which I couldn't find a translation for it, but there's a Russian, uh, Zanetta is a name which means the sainted one, so that's a possibility for the, the name of this piece. <laughs> The town of Williamsburg, Virginia is the world's largest living history museum, and it has been restored to what it may have looked like in the year 1770. And uh, I'm going to be playing a harpsichord piece composed by Peter Pelham, who was the organist of Bruton Parish Church in the year 1770 in Williamsburg, Virginia.
Our next composer, William Byrd, had the distinction of not only being a Catholic composer in Protestant Elizabethan England, but was also favored with Queen Elizabeth and held the exclusive rights to publish music in England. Because of his monopoly on the sale of music, other English composers of the day, such as William Brady, whom we heard before, and John Dowland, were forced to leave England to seek employment in the courts of continental Europe. Byrd's output includes both choral and instrumental music, Bird's sacred choral music are considered treasures of the English church music and are still sung regularly today. Bird wrote extensively for the virginal, which is a relative of the harpsichord, as we have here this evening, and also for the viol family of instruments. The Fantasia Next was originally composed for viol consort. In it, Bird makes extensive use of imitation between the parts, but not without playfulness, especially in the triplet section.
Italian composer Giuseppe Guami was born in Lucca in Tuscany and studied organ and sang at San Marco in Venice. His career took him to Munich and back to Italy, where he again served as organist at San Marco alongside Giovanni Gabrielli, whom we heard at the beginning of the program. Among his output are canzones such as La Lucchesina, written in the polychoral Venetian style, and like Gabrielli's canzone, employ at least one shift into three beats per measure. We have conjectured that there may be a young lady back in Guami's hometown for which this piece is named. Guami spent his final years back in Luca where he was employed as an organist. <laughs> Our last piece was composed by the English musician John Bennett, who was born in about 1735. He worked for the last 30 years of his life as a church organist, but he was a versatile musician, playing the organ and the viola, teaching harpsichord, and performing as both a singer and dancer in a prominent London theater. <laughs> 